Thank you, Premier. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. Um, it's been a fantastic experience for me to have the opportunity to uh, come down here, spend some time trying to understand things. And of course, when you come from the outside, you don't know a lot, right? So I've had lots of help. I must give a special thanks to uh, Gabriel Kelly, who has managed me, and, um, and Rhodes that have minded me so that I have managed to get to my meeting and other things in time. One of the things that you ask to do in a program like this is to um, have a view on what is there and what can be improved. Um, you have a fantastic uh, country. You have many good companies. You have a lot of things that works well, which is evidenced by the fact that you perform in all rankings well. But my role is not to look at those things. My role is to look at the things that can be done better. So by definition, one tends to get somewhat of a negative taint when one speaks. 
But um, you have to take that against the backdrop that there are many things that work very well here. So, what I will do is to try to give you an overview. I will try to start with the big picture. I will work my way down, give some recommendations uh, as we go through. Uh, you will find um, little pieces of papers on your seats, and as you have questions, feel free to write them down and shoot them out into the aisle, and somebody will pick them out, and somebody, not me, will select some questions to be asked at the end. Now, this, of course, is a, is a fantastically interesting domain, um, and one can speak for hours about these things, so obviously I will be limited to touching upon a, a few things. We all have heard of that, but I think it's important to start by understanding the role manufacturing plays, and I'm going to define it in a minute that manufacturing isn't quite what we think it is. Um, it is the biggest spender on research and innovation, so you can see that the, the total spending on research in countries is closely correlated to how much manufacturing activities they have. Uh, it is the key driver of productivity improvement. If you go into service sectors, if you go into public sectors, most of the productivity improvements that migrate into that sectors are migrating out of manufacturing into those sectors. So the ideas are normally generated in manufacturing because that is where the productivity pressures are the highest. It is, as we heard, critical for export earnings, and I'll give you some uh, warning examples what happens if you don't have manufacturing. It's also the largest drivers of, of services, specifically high-value services. And, and there, is a, there is a misconception here that somehow we are migrating into a service economy where we don't need manufacturing. Anybody who has visited a town that has died because its manufacturing disappeared will find there are no services left. Right? Where did they go? You know, that's a service economy. You know, we can live without manufacturing, so they should be boomerang along, shouldn't they? Doesn't happen. Most services are relating to manufacturing, and a very big chunk is done by manufacturing firms. Um, and uh, let me illustrate that with an example. Um, a very large manufacturing, high technology manufacturing company is called Ericsson. It does telecommunication infrastructure. It's got 98,000 employees. The distribution is 22,000 in research and development, 50,000 in solutions and services, 26,000 in production, management, and administration. Is that a service company? Is that a manufacturing company? Well, that depends on how you count it. But for sure, there will be no services out of Ericsson if they have no products that they manufacture. And as the Premier said, these are the jobs that generate the rest of the jobs in the economy, between two and five, depending on the structure of the economy. And manufacturing is heavily embedded. You can't just cut it out. If you look at the Australian economy, you can see these numbers. So manufacturing buy for $22 billion from the agricultural sector and they sell back $8 billion worth of equipment and things. They buy for $51 billion from the resources sector, raw materials and so on, and they sell back stuff for $12 billion. They uh, buy $74 billion worth of services, but they sell back $142 billion of stuff. And that is partly because a lot of services is around manufacturing. You know, you have a photocopier, it needs to be serviced. You know, somebody comes that without a photocopier, no service. So there is a lot of those issues. And as the Premier said, uh, South Australia is heavily dependent on manufacturing. You are almost as dependent, is very close, is 0.6 of a percentage point uh, as Victoria is. So the two manufacturing dependent states are Victoria and South Australia. So this is critical for you. You've got 82,000 people in this state involved in manufacturing. And let's do the numbers on that. 82,000 generating easily another two jobs, at least. No, that's another 160,000. At the original 80 and a few up roundings, you get 250,000. Each of those will have at least one dependent who live on them, you know, a parent or a spouse or a child. That's half a million people. So one third of this state is directly 
related to manufacturing, and I'm forgetting all the indirect follow-on effects. So you can't afford to let this one go. Not only that, when you've listened to the debate which I have here, there is one argument that's been completely misunderstood, and that is, and never really brought out, I think, and that is the social aspect of manufacturing. And let's do a little, you know, exercise, one of those mathematical exercises. The Australian economy today, the mining sector and the manufacturing sector ma makes up about the same size. They're about 10% of the economy. Uh, so what we can do on paper is that we can kill off manufacturing and double mining. So economically, we have the same situation. What we tend to forget then is what I just said. Mining in Australia employs about 200,000 people. Manufacturing about a million. So what that means is that if we double mining and half manufacturing, we have just lost a net loss of 600,000 unemployed you know, at that point. But forget, don't forget the indirect effect. So these one million in manufacturing generates another two million jobs, whereas the mining generates less than one, but let's be generous and give them one, so they generate a total of another 400,000. So we now have 300 peop three million people without job, and we have a total of 800,000 with job. So we just have a net unemployment of 2.2 million, each of these with a dependent that four and a half million people without income, then what happens is what you see on the picture at the bottom. You get riots on the street. That picture is from a domain in Europe which experienced exceedingly high unemployment when manufacturing had a really high downturn in that domain, and people had nothing to do. So they went out and threw petrol bombs on the street at police, right? You don't want that. Manufacturing is critical for social cohesion, as Danny Roderick, the professor at Harvard University, states. There has been a time, generally up until the financial crisis, where some countries said, um, we don't need it. We're going to be fine. You know, we have a very productive financial services industry, as the UK said. But unfortunately, you had the global financial crisis. And what happened? not so good things. So after the financial crisis, there has been a set of call to arms. You know, you have seen all kinds of reports, all kinds of issues around we need manufacturing. But you know, once you have let it go, it is very, very difficult to get it back. And I will show you why in a, in a second or so. And you also look at the countries that recover the best from the global financial crisis. They are all based around high value added, export-oriented manufacturing industries. The latest numbers I have in a minute I will show you is, for example, Sweden, where this year's economic growth is expected to be 5.3%. Right. China is around manufacturing, uh, but only 15% of what they produce is exported. The rest is consumed domestically, and that has some implications we will see in a minute. This little picture is me plotting the latest data I have. On the x-axis, you see competitiveness as released this month from the World Economic Forum. So more to the right you are, the more competitive you are. The y-axis is economic growth, as uh, the numbers I could get for all the countries were of June of this, this year, so before the little upheaval. But generally speaking, it's the same picture. So the higher up, the more you grow economically. And what you see is that China grows very fast, but is not incredibly competitive, but is rather competitive. And then you have some countries on the right and some upwards. So you get some form of a, a, a frontier where people seem to end up. So what we can do is we can rank economies, you know, how close they are to some form of optimal point, which is the top right-hand corner. And if we see who are the closest, and so we get the list on the right. So closest is Sweden, followed by China, followed by Finland, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, and so forth. The countries in red are the European manufacturing belt. The countries in blue are the so-called BRICS countries. Australia is in yellow, and some other interesting countries are in black. So there is a message here around performance relating to manufacturing. And by the way, competitiveness today is a predictor of economic growth tomorrow. So this is very, very important. Let me, don't worry about the text, let me give you a warning example, which is called the United States of America, okay? 
Since the year 2000, they have lost approximately 5 million manufacturing jobs. And that means they have lost, an, in addition to that, another 10 or so million other jobs. So they have 15 million jobs in total gone as a consequence of this over those years. And of course, there wouldn't be, you know, there wouldn't really be a problem unless it was the fact that, uh, you know, if you migrate to services, if you did, it wouldn't be a problem if there wasn't for the fact that manufacturing is better paid. Manufacturing is on average paid 75% higher in the US than jobs in the services sector. And the services sector, the high level services which you want, you know, investment banking, accounting, consulting, and so on, yes, they pay well, but they are few and they don't grow very much. Uh, what you find is that these things have migrated over to what we call personal and social services, you know, hairdressing and the like. And that is the least economically productive jobs in any economy, but it is part of the service economy. Right. So what you then have is that that has shaved off part of the growth rate of the US growth every year by a third of a percent. You know, that, that's, you feel that. Then, um, as a consequence of all this, of course, you no longer produce all the things you would like to produce, so you have to import. So today in the US, you import half of what is sold, and you only export half of that again, so a quarter of everything is exported, the rest is domestically. But a lot of what you export is built on inputs that are imported. So at the moment, the US runs a trade deficit of 11% of gross national product, increasing by the odd percentage point every year. This is a disaster. They are never going to get out of that one in our lifetime. They have trade deficit in every single part of manufacturing, from high tech to low tech. Who high? Chinese manufacturer computers employ more people than the complete computer industry in the US. So, you need a healthy manufacturing sector if you want to be an advanced economy who want to maintain both economic and social well-being. That is my first message. Unfortunately, as I said, manufacturing is frequently misunderstood, partly because people have this picture of the early end of the film rather than the late part of the film. So they think this is, you know, metal bashing and dangerous and dirty and we will all die of asbestosis. Um, it is dramatically changing. The other ones is that countries like Ericsson will be classified as service companies. But actually they are manufacturing companies. So the public statistics is a problem in this. And then, of course, there is something about, if you're not familiar with this, if you don't understand where technology is going, if you don't understand this shift into service of the businesses, and if you don't quite understand the behavioral economics of these type of things, then maybe you will have insufficient knowledge if you make decisions. And you will make statements which are blatantly wrong. You know, I have some quotes there. Manufacturing is dying. We can live without manufacturing. Oh, go and have a look in the UK. Okay. The future is in services. Oh, well, that's fine as long as you have a manufacturer to serve, all right? And the resource sector will be our future. It will, I'm sure it will be a very good part of the future, but it's not going to be the sole part of the future. This is another manufacturing company, Rolls-Royce. They make aircraft engines. They don't sell engines. They sell power by the hour. So, you know, you don't pay for the engines. You pay for the use of the engines. Is that a service firm? Is it a manufacturing firm? So what you can see is this migration makes things look like the service economy is growing. But actually underpinning it is very sophisticated manufacturing, which is frequently misunderstood. So manufacturing is in decline in some countries, but not in all countries. Very important message. So let's move our scale down a bit and start to look at what we could call the intermediate perspective. I found a nice old map of South Australia there to illustrate that. There are many different types of manufacturing and depending on where on the world you are, you have more opportunities in some than in others. Uh, and I have illustrated here what I define as the normal sectors of, of, of manufacturing. So you have these, these you know, scale-intensive industries. That's where you need long series of things. And in order to succeed there, you normally need a very large domestic market. And you don't have a large domestic market. So the future for those type of firms in that domain is bleak. 
Sorry, but that's the way it is, right? Sweden is another one of those countries which does not have a large domestic market in case, in spite of the fact that we're in the EU. We used to have a very large car industry. Now we have half of that as a car industry in Sweden, but it is not Swedish. You know, Volvo is now Chinese, and Saab is dead. Hmm? That's life. Things die. That happens to all companies. The average lifespan of a firm on the US stock exchange is 45 years. You know, it's shorter than us. So we will see most of the firms we know today die at some point. That's life. Then you have other things, you know, specialized supplier industries, traditional manufacturing, dynamic increasing returns. In other words, once you get in, you have huge profits. Variation intensive industries, in other words, places where every unique thing you build looks different from the previous one you built. You have science-based industries, not medical instrument. And then you have this new emerging one where you have huge opportunities which is digital manufacturing, the digitalization of the manufacturing product, which removes the whole issue of distance. Right? Suddenly, it's irrelevant, and I will give you some examples of that. Because all of these sectors are impacted by the converging technologies, and you know, I'm very briefly going to touch up those. But there are generally four key technologies that we look at as converging. Uh, biotechnology which will dramatically change, all of this will change most firms. Biotechnology is the last of the three key science domains, physics, chemistry, and mathematics, to move from being a science to being an engineering domain. You know, uh, and that means that we cannot do things with it. Uh, and obviously, when we talk about biotechnology, we tend to use a unit uh, of working, which is a genome. So we can now build bacteria that did not exist yesterday that does things we want it to do. That's known as synthetic biology. And these will enable us to more or less take what we need from the air, convert those carbon atoms with oxygen into sugars, use the sunlight driving the bacteria to convert those sugars into further type of chemicals, and have very sophisticated products out in the end. You don't want to be in chemical industry unless you understand biotechnology. And this is already happening, but it starts in the high end. So the pharmaceutical industry has been migrating to biotechnology for about 20 years. Yeah? But it's very difficult to migrate if you have 60,000 chemical engineers rather than 60,000 biotechnology people. So the way they have to do it is to manage the existing business in a slow 20-year decline curve while you build up a completely new business, normally for acquisition of small firms around biotechnology. So this will impact everything. And suddenly that means that raw materials, which we didn't think about before, become very, very valuable. And this is a great opportunity for the states, because these are things like leftover straw on the fields. These are things like trees, which all become biomass inputs to an industry that can produce high-value components. Not to mention the ability to add value to food products by doing functional foods and issues like that. Then we have nanotechnology, and it's a funny word. It only means we work with small things. Um, and the unit there of analysis is atoms. And what it will enable us to do is to construct materials that did not exist before. And those materials will have specific characteristics. So we will have materials that will have conductivity in certain ways. They will behave certain things. They will change color in certain ways. They will carry information. Your T-shirt will be uh, driven by your body heat. And it will, in its own right, contain automatic connections to the internet. And it will change the way it looks, depending on what fashion you want. And I have seen those things in operation. Right? They exist. They are still on the experimental stage, but they exist. And they will be on the market in the not too distant future. So this is some of the things we will see with nanotechnology. ICT, of course, you all know that, information and communication technologies. That's the issue we have around everything going digital. And there we see things like three-dimensional printing. So we will work on a digital file on a computer designing our object. We will then test it in a virtual environment on the computer. We will then spool and send this file over to a little box with our client. And this box is a three-dimensional printer, and it will print out the object that we have when the customer needs it, and he will pay for it as he needs it, not in other ways. And that will dramatically change things, and in a positive way, because we will not waste material. And also, distance no longer matters. You know, it doesn't cost the same thing to have one of those printers standing in Malaysia, standing in Victoria. Distance has gone away in that sense. So when your lawnmower breaks down because you run the blade over a stone, you go home, you push the button, and out comes a new blade. 
and you will laugh at me. Go back to 1990 when somebody said this about laser printers in printing and nobody believed them. It's exactly the same development that happened to the printing industry is now happening to the manufacturing industry. Get with it. Otherwise, it will happen to you what happened to the printing companies, and there are three types of them. The largest groups are the ones who said, this is nothing for us. They are no longer with us. Right? The next groups are the ones who said, this is interesting, I'll try it out. They are there and have changed the business and do reasonably well. But what we have is a huge amount of firms that did not exist before, that emerged as a consequence of the opportunities this technology generated. And they are out there, and they do many things, and they do them very profitable. They tend not to call themselves printing companies. Right? And the last one is the cognitive sciences, our ability to understand how the brain works and how we as human beings operate with our brain. And the entity there is neurons. Uh, and what that has implications for two, at least two domains. One is how we interact with machines. So we understand how we as human beings can work with machine and adopt the machine accordingly. The other one is things like artificial intelligence, the replication of human beings. Five or so years ago, we used to have artificial intelligences that um, was about the brightness of a cockroach. Well, it's not a lot, but it's better than nothing, right? Now we are moving into kind of high-level lizards and migrating into small mice. So that's roughly where we are now. And we expect that around 2030 or so we will be on the level of human beings. That, of course, is going to be interesting because one will wonder what the view they will have on us. And there is a famous quote from a scientific, science fiction author who said uh, that the epitaph on mankind's gravestone will read the artificial intelligence did not hate mankind. The artificial intelligence did not love mankind. But mankind was made up of atoms that the artificial intelligence could use for better things. Right? So, you know, we have to think about that. Now, all these technologies will generate new business opportunities. And in this state, you have a lot of them. And most of them, in my humble opinion, not leveraged to the extent they could be. You have huge comparative advantages in a number of raw materials. I've just listed some of them up there. And all of those can, with modern technologies, develop value change with really high value added, which is what you want, which is an export issue. So instead of selling the wheat by the cubic meter, you provide some heavily fortified, sophisticated, transformed loaf that make people healthier. And then you can sell that for a lot of money. Others have realized this too, so they work hard. Of course, in Europe we do a lot of things, and uh, you know, I'll point out a few of those. You, know, you see a new human robot corporation in advanced factory environments. That's about how we as human beings work with robots that are intelligent. It's very interesting. And the red one there is a production using environment neutral materials. That's what you're trying to achieve in Tonsley Park. So I think that is a, a good thing. But not only the Europeans are doing it. I thought I'd just show you the other side of this coin as well. This is Chinese manufacturing industry focus for the future. And they have huge focus on bio-based manufacturing issues to substitute what they do. And this is their roadmap. Now, the difference between a roadmap in Australia and a roadmap in China is in China, it is done. Okay? Because if you don't do it, nasty things happen to you. All right? It's one of those things. That's one of the advantages of a, of a command economy. Um, so what about this offshoring business, you know, sending things off to other countries to reduce cost? Well, here are two interesting quotes. The first one relates to Switzerland, okay? So, you know, this is a big company, and they sell everywhere in the world, but they still do things in Switzerland, the highest cost environment in the world. And they do it because it's value for money, not because it is cheap. Oh, and the second one is the R&D director of Scania, the truck maker, all right? And basically, it says that in, up until ridiculous levels, you know, which 15% is, up until that level, it doesn't pay to offshore because you need to integrate research with manufacturing. And do note that when manufacturing go, research goes with it. Right? Very important message there. It's not going to stay. And if you think you're going to offshore to China to save costs, you're seven years too late. There is a dramatic increase in the offshoring by Chinese manufacturers out of China because the costs in China are too high. 
So for example, if you go and talk with Chinese furniture manufacturing, they have most of their activities now offshore to Vietnam that support, that provides the furniture that's produced for the Chinese market because China is too expensive, right? So the low cost game, forget it. So manufacturing is changing. It's totally different from what it has been. Now, dealing with that is not so easy, specifically our small economy. Now, small economies is difficult, primarily because you don't have the same number of heads. It's a numbers game. It's as simple as that. If you have, a, if you have an economy of three people, it's very difficult to guarantee that somebody will have the right idea. If you have an economy of 300 million people, it's more likely that somebody will have the right idea. So the smaller the economy, the more market failure is an attribute of the economy as a whole. So the more government needs to take an active role to ensure that the economy doesn't go down the wrong way. What happened there? There we go. Go down the wrong way. The other problem is that in a small economy, you tend not to find your customers. You know, it's difficult to find a customer. And that means that, you know, you have a tendency to migrate to places where the customers are. And you can see that, you know, I was in Melbourne and spoke and I asked the audience, you know, how many of you started your business manufacturing orders in South Australia? And about a third of the hands came up. You know, if I ask people here how many started your manufacturing company in Victoria, there are not going to be very many hands. So there is a migration from here to that state. And the more rational the decision maker are, the more likely they will move. So what you want is non-rational decision makers. You want people who are grown up here, who are embedded here, who live here, and say, it's not worth it because I like it here. Those are the type of firms you need. So the role of government in a small economy is by necessity and justifiably more interventionist. Don't be afraid of it. It's a necessity. If you don't do it, somebody else will do it to you. In addition, you do have some symptoms of Dutch disease, and, and Dutch disease is one of those contests bound around. It's actually very simple. It, it says the economy is made up of three components, and the first thing that happens is that the resource taker takes off. People pay a lot of money for getting the ore. That's a great thing. So they grow. So what they need is more people. So they get the more people from the traded goods sector, which is manufacturing, and from the service area, more or less. Right? As a consequence, of course, with that, the money gets spent on their services. These guys come back down and they want to have a good time and they buy all those type of service activities. And that means that the service sector and the non trader goods grow, right? And they need people. Uh, so they take it. So the supplier of people here tends to be net the manufacturing sector. And they will find that they are under the pressure for these type of things. And as a consequence, they shrink. In addition to that, being a rich country, having all this wealth streaming in, the exchange rate goes up, you know, which you may have noticed recently. You know? And that, of course, puts pressure on the people who cannot raise their price, which is the manufacturers, because they compete on a global market. Whereas the, the local guys here who sell services, they can raise the price as much as they want, because there's a supply and demand locally, so they don't suffer. So what we have is that if this is allowed to run unchecked, we have a cross over the manufacturing industry, which is a really bad idea. And the reason for that is that it takes a long time to rebuild it. And why does it do that? It is because of technology speed. So imagine three runners. You know, you know the story of the hare and the you know, turquoise, right? Three runners, and they all kind of set off. But run runs 15 times faster than normal. Another runs five times faster than normal, and one runs three times faster than normal. And what I now do is I tell the guy who runs you know, 15 times normal to get off, okay? Forget it. You are no longer here. But the competition have left theirs on. So what I now have to do is I have to take one of these slow guys and tell him, you have to catch up with the guy who has been running 15 times faster for quite some time. What do you think the probability is they're ever going to catch up? One of those Archimedean problems, right? No, it's, it, it's not going to happen. So rebuilding manufacturing is almost hopeless once you have let it go. So don't let it go. That's the key message. It's critical. Now, so what I've shown before I get into my recommendations now is that manufacturing is critical. It's not in decline everywhere, as people keep telling you. 
It is changing, and that is what's fooling people, both technologically as well as the service component and the business models. And in a small economy, government has a role to play, and in an economy showing signs, or may showing signs of Dutch disease, it also has a role to play. So, my first recommendation is to put in place a policy or a strategy, whatever word you want to choose, that deals with these three integrated components, industry, innovation, and research, because they are interlinked. Right? And the purpose of this is to enhance, secure de-risk and enhance the economic value creation in the state. Such piece of work has begun on a manufacturing strategy. And as far as I understand, it will be ready to come out sometime towards the end of the year. So that is a good thing. But it needs to have clear focus on high value adding. You have a lot of very good firms. And I had the pleasure of working with a number of them in my, in my tenure here. But of course, that is self-selection. So what you get is the good ones. You don't get the ones you should have gotten, who are not so good. Right? You have far too many firms that over a long period of time has allowed themselves to become lazy and has decided that they're going to compete on cost and cost only. Now, welcome to the high cost operating environment. You can no longer compete on cost. And it will not help if you fire all your employees and hire half literate newly made citizens and hope you save 20% of your salary. It ain't going to make a difference you have to go up the value chain, more value added. It's the only solution. So such a policy needs to be fact-based. And you do have a problem. You don't have enough data around what exists here. So you need to get your facts in order in order to make sure to make the right decision. You need to um, have a view on the future. And, and that actually is quite critical. Um, let me give you two examples. If I am a sub-supplier in the automotive industry, I am very competent because I've been under pressure for a long time. But that also means that my day is taken up by staying alive, uh, in that sense. Famous song about that, isn't it? Uh, the, um, so there is something around that. And that means that how much time can they use reflecting on what other supply chains they may end up with and get the right knowledge about those? The answer is not enough because they don't have the money and they don't have the man hours. So one thing that governments can do and does do in many countries is provide these type of maps where they say, this is the way the landscapes look. We have identified the capabilities you have and here are the other industries where that could be used. We don't care where you go, but at least you now have some information to make a decision on. The other one, for example, is that there is going to be quite a lot of money available uh, in these green funds of different types. Now, that means that uh, that's a resource for you. It's a resource to transform and change industries. But it requires a little bit of planning because you need to put in these applications, you need to understand what it's about, and so on. And again, companies don't have the, the ability to do that on their own. It's too much effort to this complexity. But if you, for example, as a government said, we're going to look into what materials in our value chains could be substituted for materials that could be made out of greener stuff, right? then that is a basis for projects that could benefit these firms. And sometimes you need to get a grip on what your left and right hands are doing. And I will illustrate that with an example that was brought to my attention in the um, manufacturing roundtable in Canberra the other week. The Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency is, of course, building a new building. Uh, so for that building, they've gone out and um, uh, gone for tenders, which one would expect them to do. And they buy this in a very traditional way, so lowest purchasing price, no more thinking. So they've acquired, my understanding, is 80 tons of aluminium for about 5 million Australian dollars from a Chinese company. This Chinese company operates an aluminium plant, which is one of the dirtiest in the world, with 50% higher emission rates than the dirtiest Australian one. Uh, and it's also a company that you are exposing to dumping proceedings. And of course they are cheaper if they dump. They, they kind of come naturally, right? Instead of saying that, look, we are in the environmentally friendly business, so we're going to buy on life cycle cost and emission, and we're going to open up for smarter techniques and tools like uh, 
wood plastic composites, which have the same characteristics on the hole in window frames as aluminum does, which can form the basis for a high value added production out of the wood value chain that you have here. Doesn't seem that the right hand is talking to the left hand, and you need to become a little bit better on that. You need to do this in a structured way. You need to have a dialogue with the stakeholders. That means you listen to them. It doesn't mean you do what they tell you, okay? Big difference, but you will always listen to them and have a dialogue. You anchor what you're gonna do so it's implementable, and you have continuity so you don't throw it around from left to right. And I know it's difficult, but it's very important. And for doing that, I suggest a, a tool that we use in, in many European countries, which is a kind of a, a little council made up of key stakeholders from government, the different ministries concerned, from industry, from academia, who together sets priorities of what is important, primarily by deselecting what we can't do. So it's not about picking winners, it's about deselecting losers, because we don't have resources to do everything. There's something about also having a better performing innovation system, I'll come back to that, and I will not be popular in everything I say, so I'm aware of that, so I will duck any tomatoes and things. Um, but one of the things is that you need to clarify the roles for what is the role of cabinet, what is the role of the departments, and what's the role of implementation agencies. And that has tend to be diffuse. And as a consequence of being diffuse, it has not been evaluated well enough and not enough demands are put up. So cabinet sets the big picture target, department breaks it down to how we want the industry portfolio to look, and the agency delivers this to the individual firm so that there is a dialogue on these things. And everybody is responsible upwards and is evaluated downwards. And you need to develop some tools you haven't been very good at having. Uh, some of those is um, what I would call an extension of industry participation policy into an industry engagement policy. You have these fantastic resources in the state. You have some projects already there and some more coming online, Olympic Dam, but it's only going to be the first of numerous ones, which are a huge opportunity for the state. But you have to ensure that those benefits are migrating into the state, not only in terms of money, because money comes and money goes. So it's about contributing to growth in the industry structure. And I think you should go and learn from the places who've done this very well, and I suggest that you go on a trip, and you go on a trip that visits three places in two countries. You go to Ontario in Canada, who has built a great manufacturing industry around its resources boom. You go to the Hebron project in Newfoundland, which is now coming online, which is doing the same thing. And preferably go and hire some of the guys who did it up there and bring them down here so they can do it here. It's the cheapest way of transferring knowledge. And then you go over and look in Norway, who has developed a complete global industry in the petroleum support and supply chain, which you will see whenever you go out to your offshore industries here and learn what they have done in order to achieve that successful outcome over the years been operating. Uh, you also need to put in place uh, Cluster policies, I know sometimes they have a bad name, but that's because they're frequently misunderstood. Clusters are not firms that do the same thing. They are firms that have synergistic relationship with each other around shared capability basis. And you do that in a synergistic environment, so the output of one industry is an input to another. So there's an opportunity to do this around these value chains that we spoke around. And you should put in place a smart procurement program, an Australian version of what is a very successful American program, which are used also in the UK under a similar name and under the rest of the European manufacturing countries under something called a lead customer initiative. But they're basically the same thing. Uh, and the way it works very simplistically is that you get a small amount of money and you open up for firms with great ideas to benefit the agency and they can come with a proposition and it has to be something that does not exist today and if they think they can be beneficial, they can buy a prototype. You don't need to go to tender for a prototype. The benefit for that for the firm is that you get proof of concept, you develop your capability to produce it, and you have a reference installation. All of the things necessary to take this to the next stage internationally. This is an innovation system. It has all the players, these are just examples. But you need to get it to work together. And there are some issues here, and I'm going to be a little bit nasty for a minute, if I may. In the area where I come from, if you go and ask universities, what is your primary purpose in life? And these are good research universities, like, for example, for those who are familiar with it, Karolinska Institute is one of the leading medical research institutes in the world. They will say our primary purpose is teaching. Right? And then we do research in order to be able to teach. 
And that means when we engage with firms, we do it for two reasons. One is they provide an interesting problem for us, and the other one is they automatically will disseminate the solution to them because we're into teaching, we give people knowledge. When I go here and talk to universities, and nobody named and nobody forgotten, um, the answer is our primary purpose in life is research. And of course you get what you pay for in a sense, you know, the boundary conditions are that. Now if that is the case, then the role of education is a source of fund for research. You know? So the only role of education is to grant money to research. Right? And that means that the firm is another source of money. Right? So you engage with the firm in order to get money. And then you do some research. And then, of course, you put IP on that and you try to sell it back to the firm. You know? That is not conducive to repeat business. Uh, and what happens there is you have a real problem around engagement, primarily with medium and small sized firms and universities, because the whole system is skewed, it doesn't work. So there's a number of things that need to be addressed here, but a lot of them are on the federal level, but there are other similar issues that need to be addressed. So, key actions you need to have in this domain is to find lead customers, which are normally public sector in small economy, hospitals, SA, water and the like like that, and make sure that they engage with these type of procurement programs in the local economy. Then you have to figure out in your value chain which company out there in the world, if we had them here, would really make a difference. So have a targeted foreign direct investment policy. Target the given company with a given proposition to get them here with the bits you want. Don't just shoot at anything that moves. Right? So you link things into that are good for you and good for them. Then you have too few of these research organizations that actually are used to working with firms, be it the Fraunhofer, be it the TNO in Holland, be it a Sintef in Norway, a RISE in Sweden, or a VTT in Finland. You need to get those type of organizations present here because they are the ones that assist SMEs in all these countries and make them very successful. You know, one of the successful of Swiss SMEs in all studies is that they work continuously with the Swiss National Technical Research Institute that enables them to innovate and innovate and innovate again because they talk with companies who are used, to, people who are used to working with companies. And you need to get your, your university to do this better. Then a little detailed picture. We go down quickly on the firm level uh, and then a few things. Generally speaking, uh, if I look all over the place and you know, forget all those good firms who do wonderful things, and I'll give you an example in a minute of such a firm is you know you on the whole have two areas we need to improve one is better at innovating and i'll come back to that i have never been in a country where you are better at reactive problem solving so if i got a problem i can come to your firm and you figure up a solution instantaneously even if it contains a piece of plywood and a few pieces of wire and it will work right you are very very good at that but that's not innovation Innovation is something you do strategically, directed, and arriving at again and again and again. At that, on the whole, you are very bad. You also have an issue with management competence, and I come back to that, because that is really, I think, the most dangerous thing. So what would I say, and I have borrowed some statements here from what will be a document that will come out soon, which I agree with and also in some small indirect way contributed to. Uh, firstly, Understand the distinction between services and solution and develop product, services, solution systems, not one's physical product. Innovate constantly up the value add. Right? Innovate to appropriate the value add because, for example, if you're a food company and you innovate, it's a big risk that all that value is taken by the retailer. You don't want that. You want to keep that value. So you need to innovate in order to appropriate it and that's what we call business model innovations. You have to work collaboratively and you have to work globally. Broaden the mind, work with others out there, even if it's open innovation, whatever you choose to call it. Develop and acquire your management capabilities, and I'll show some of the pictures about intangible resources and intangible assets. Go down the route of low resource footprint and ensure that you are quite agile and flexible and develop these fantastic growing markets out there in Brazil, Russia, uh, China, India, and South Africa as growing markets. And when you add value, don't worry too much about the complexity of these things, you actually have three domains in which we tend to be very familiar with, with, with um, one. We have science and engineering, of course we use that to add value. 
The other one that will add very quickly value is design, and design is frequently misunderstood. The purpose of design is to change the customer's behavior in such a way that the customer is better off afterwards, and his behavior as a consequence of that benefits me. Example is the iPhone. How many of you got an iPhone? Hand up. That's a lot of people, all right? When you got that one, you had to change the way you used the phone. You know? And changing your way, you figure out there were lots of things you could do you couldn't do before. And you are very happy doing all those things. But as a consequence, you use more data than you have ever used. And that makes the telecom operator very happy, right? You also buy applications, which makes the application providers very happy. And also Apple, by the way, they get a chunk of that. And you are very loyal to the brand, so you will buy a new iPhone next time, which makes Apple very happy. So you are happy, and everybody else is happy. That's exactly what design is about, because the technology isn't very good. You know, it breaks frequently, and it's very old technology. But that's, not, that's irrelevant, because you love it, because it's well designed. Right? And then you can work with art and medical thinking as well. I'm not going to go into those. In order to appropriate value, you need to have smart business models, and the, the, the domain is that the ultimate objective is to have a revenue stream, sorry, a net profit stream, which is higher than your primary revenue stream. Very important that. In other words, you make more profit than the, cost, the product price that you sell. That's the art form. Very, very important. And if you look at some of these firms out there, they are very good at doing that. Examples like Ryanair, examples like Apple, and so on. They are very, very good in smart ways. And you need to be effective. In other words, you have to sell the right thing to the right people, which is what they want, not what they don't want. This is your problem. This is a study that Roy Green's done at the University of Sydney with a few other people around the world, looking at management capability. And management capability is like the gearbox in a car, right? So if you only have first gear, you can't go very fast. But if you have all the gears up, you can go very fast. And management capacity and capability is the gearbox. And Australia is decidedly second tier on average in this domain. Not very good at all. So you really need to up your game here. This picture shows the difference between Australian performance in the different domains of management capability and the best performing country around. And the two best performers on that area is US and Sweden. They all come out top in these different areas, depending on which one you look at. And that's a big difference. You can look at, it, look at the gaps. Here you need to upgrade. And that means, you, and the reason you are low of two front, one is you need business schools who are more up to date and more relevant. I don't like business schools, but the slide used are from 1970. Okay. Uh, the second issue is you are lacking the factories of good managers. Those factories are the big corporates. That is where people get trained to know these things. That is why the automotive industry is so critically important for it supplies good managers to the rest of this, this industry. So one of the things they do, for example, the Hebron project, which is why you should go and look at it, is they require that the big prime enhances the management capability of the small firms it deals with. That's part of an industry engagement policy. Very important. Investments in intangibles, which are research and development, information communication technologies, organization structures, design brand equity, and education and training of your staff. Here is the numbers from latest research which came out this year. You can see business services in Australia and Sweden compared in green. Sweden invests a little bit more in these things than Australia, but it's not an enormous difference in terms of percentage point. Look at the manufacturing side. The difference in investment in these intangibles in Australia compared to Swedish firm is dramatic. This is completely unacceptable. And the big gaps are training of staff, ICT, and R&D. That's where it really is a difference. And all of those are future-proofing the firm. If you don't do that, you're not going to be here tomorrow. You really need to shape up on that one. If you do it, and work with universities and have good management, you can go with these things. This is SMR, who I will gratefully say thank you to for allowing me to borrow the material. But they have come up with new materials that enable them to bring new products to markets, which has huge benefit for them in their existing supply chain, but also opens opportunities by definition, because it's new material, to do other things. And that is, of course, great. That's exactly what we want to firms like this. So you have many firms that do the right thing. Right? Here is the recipe for success for a firm. Right? It needs to have depth of knowledge of its domain. It really needs to know more than a customer does. 
It needs to have well-trained, high-performing employees that add value every day. And there has to be an unarticulated contract between the employer and the employee. So I, the employer, will make you, the employee, more employable while you work with me. You, the employee, will contribute to my firm's success while you are employed. It's a mutual understanding. Focus, narrow niche areas. Don't go broad, right? Partner with centers that can actually leverage your expertise. You can't know everything, but partner with the ones who understand how to work with you. Innovate, innovate, innovate. Be close to the customers so you know them better than they know themselves. Right? Do it globally from day one. Right? If you have good employees, you can decentralize. You don't need to have everything in your own hands. They can do it because they are competent people. Right? Have really good offerings in the product and the service and the solution domain and have leadership that is entrepreneurial, it's capable and sets ambitious goals. These are the basis for success in all the firms we see around the world, and you need to have that too. All in all, I have about 50 recommendations. Uh, there are a number of them I've spoken through here, and I'm not going to go through them in detail. I'm happy to have text questions on them. There will be a documentation coming out with all those things in them. I will finish there, and I will happily take questions, but let me finish on this note. I have a huge belief in your opportunities. I have rarely seen a place with as much unutilized potential as here. It's a great opportunity, all right? But these good outcomes will not happen by themselves. And as a state, doing nothing is just not an option. Thank you. How can South Australia's economic goals be supported by government agencies and other organisations? I th I, firstly, I, I think that's not so difficult. I, I think it is a... The one word that is used in the Anglo-Saxon world is joined up government. You know, is this issue about understanding that this goal requires these activities from the Department of Health, this activity from the Department of Primary Industry, this activity from Innovate SA, this activity from so forth and so forth. So you have a, a structured approach to it. And then you also have a continuous follow-up and you have transparency and you migrate. You have these type of strategic plans already in the state. And I think it's just a matter of you know, continuing that thinking and making it very articulate. I, it's not that difficult in my opinion. With the majority of our economy made up of SMS, SMEs, what um, main me mechanisms do we need to transform the SME sector for the high value added manufacturing industry of the future? Well, that is a, that's an excellent question. Uh, interestingly enough, um, uh, and of course the, the, the starting point to the question is absolutely correct. You are an SME economy. Um, but most economies are SME economies in that sense. Um, what you need to do, I think, is to make sure they are linked into global supply chains where they interact with large companies. And in addition to that, if you then use these opportunities, which I think these raw material-based value chains will provide in all the, the materials, then you're able to entice it in um, parts of international firms here because it's of interest. And then if you link them into the system, then you have suddenly a better position than if you don't have them. But again, it requires an, an interactive approach from a thought through foreign direct investment policy a thought through industry policy and a clarity around capability building in the, the system. And let, look, there are simple things you can do. Um, example, you can say, which I know some countries do, you can say, if you're going to sell a car to a government agency, okay, which we do by tender, here are the rules, you know, anybody can sell, but one of the rules is you need A, to have a plan for how you're going to develop your suppliers into other supply chain. You have to prove that you have the capability to execute the plan, and uh, you have to report back, as long as your supplier, how you're progressing on the plan. And I don't care if your supplier is in China, US, Australia, or Germany. It's the rule is equal for all, but it requires you to do something. And there are lots of those little tricks you can use. Uh, what are some of the most transformative products and technologies that you've come across lately? Just a quick <laughs> snapshot for us. All right, let's try to migrate them around and see if I can see. Biorefineries is probably one of the critical ones. Biorefinery is the ability to take uh, some uh, 
form of bio raw material, be it straw, be it wood, and you then convert that into a, a number of high value chemicals. Um, that is happening as we speak. It will be heavily transformative, and linked to that will be other products that we're able to do out of the wood chain. If I give a nanotechnology example, which I think will be transformative, it's nanocellulose composites. So it is a composite material made out of wood, basically, uh, but it has higher and better characteristics than carbon fiber in many aspects, and it's completely recyclable. Uh, in ICT, it's going to be 3D printing for metallic and mixed material objects. In other words, I can just print and out comes my thing. That's dramatically going to uh, transform things. And on the, um, uh, on the uh, cognitive science area, it's probably our ability to, co to construct software. They can understand and manage and process free text the way we write it and make sense of it for us. What are the key management capabilities that need greatest development to increase capacity for innovation? Firstly, in order to innovate, what you require is you need to have knowledge. Innovation is sometimes confused with creativity. Innovation in today's world is not done by an individual, it's done by a group. A lot of people think as an individual that you know, the light bulb goes on and everything is solved. Um, and I blame Walt Disney for that misunderstanding. You know? um, it's not at all like that. The world is complex. Nobody today innovates a mobile phone as a person. It's impossible. You know, you'd have huge amount of domains of knowledge. So the first thing is deep knowledge in the domains where you operate or good close links to people with deep knowledge. The second thing you need is clarity of objective, the setting objectives clearly. And the most important objective in innovation is an innovation strategy. And what is an innovation strategy? It's something very easy to say and very difficult to do. It is basically a listing of all those problems that if solved would dramatically improve the performance of the firm. So it's innovation strategy is a list of problems. All other strategies are more or less a list of solutions in that area. And thirdly, what you need is the ability to manage this as a system. So you need to have managerial system. We call them innovation management system. It's nothing to do with IT, okay? It's managerial systems. So you need to have these capacities. And then you need to have a close link and a deep understanding of your customer so that you are not only reacting to what your customers say, but as you go back to the customer and says, actually, Mr. Customer, that's not what you want that you asked for. This is what you want. And when the customer sees that, he says, yes, you're right. That is actually what I want. No? That is what you need. Thank you. What products and market opportunities do you see for green manufacturing? Oh, they are huge. Um, they are huge. I think the only thing you need to do is to go and talk to the younger generation to see how much emphasis they start to, to take on things like, is this made by a child laborer somewhere? Is this a green to product, is it low resource footprint? So the, the sentiments of consumers that are younger is changing incredibly rapidly. So I think if you look at yourself, because most in this audience I see are not quite as old as I am, but not far from it. Uh, so, you know, that means that, you know, we are looking at the wrong guys. You know, we are looking at, we have to look at the young audience. They are the ones which sets the sentiments, will be the products that will be bought directly and directly tomorrow. And their, their shift in, has been incredibly rapid in these things. They have embraced green at the same speed as they are embracing Facebook. And that gives you a feeling for how quickly it is. So I think there are huge opportunities, but you have to have, of course, a business case for it in addition to that. But don't, don't worry. The market is there, and it's there more than you think. Thank you. Uh, South Australia may lose its AAA credit rating. How do we convince politicians to invest in the long term? That's a, that's a, that's a context. <laughs> that's not for me to answer. That's probably something I should bounce to the Premier. <laughs> but it's the... Uh, but look. Perhaps a general, uh, general thoughts about politicians and long-term thinking around manufacturing. Well, uh, th this is a systemic problem. Uh, I mean, th th you have an electoral cycle, and that is life. You know, you know as a politician, you need to get re-elected. So, so what you have to do is to have... S I mean, we, I come from countries where you have more than two parties. We have many parties, and they fight it out like mad, and then they, you know, they have coalition governments left, right, and center. But what they have is that on some aspects, they come to an agreement. They say, there are, in a small country, there are some things we cannot afford 
to disagree about. Because if we do that, we will invest huge amounts of money, and then you tear it up, and it's all wasted. So on those things, we will not go to a decision before we actually agree, and then we know it will stick there. And what are those things? Well, there are huge investment infrastructure. Example, the building of nuclear reactors in Finland. It took a long, long time to get the Green Party to accept it was a good thing to do. But we didn't do anything until everybody accepted it, because we know if there's a change of government, there will be no change in policy. Number one, we can't afford to throw a number of billions in the, in the sea. That's impossible. We're too small for that. Right? So certain things you agree on. The other one tends to be industry policy. Those are the two ones which transcends borders because everybody has equally large interest in ensuring high value generation in society and social cohesion. It's like, if I may say so, the issue between the employer's organization and the union. Both of them have equal interest in profitable firms. Both of them want more profitable firms, uh, both in numbers and in profitability. That's step one. On that, they agree completely. Then they can disagree and fight it out on how to distribute the profit. That's a completely separate issue. But without the first, you won't even have a discussion on the second. So that my message is try to agree across party borders for those few handful things which are in mutual interest for everybody and can be put aside and have continuity and fight it out on the rest. Thank you very much. We're not going to have time for more questions because we have a wrap-up short address. I'd like everyone to show their appreciation of Joran Roos's presentation. Thank you so much.